Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining our webinar. It is amazing to have you here. Today, we have Becca Wertman. Um, by the way, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Sherith Runyon, and I am a coordinator uh, with Christians United for Israel, and I am pleased to introduce Becca Wertman. She is the managing editor and Canada liaison at NGO Monitor. Um, it's a Jerusalem-based research institute Becca grew up in Vancouver, British Columbia, has graduated with honors from the University of Southern California, where she earned her BA in international relations with honors in French and economics. She also has an MA in political science um, from Columbia University. She speaks on behalf of NGO Monitor's parent organization, the UN Human Rights Council on Geneva. It is amazing to have you here, Becca. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, and thank you to Kufai um, for having me here. This is very exciting, um, and I'm so thankful for this opportunity, in spite of everything that's going on in the world, to be able to present to you all. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen with you so you can follow along um, with the PowerPoint presentation that I've prepared. So just give me one second to do that. And there we go. So um, as the advertisement for this call said, I'm going to be talking about anti-Israel NGOs. That stands for non-governmental organizations. These also fall into the category of civil society organizations and other fancy acronyms that you may have heard of before. I'm going to be talking about them, about who supports them, and what, what they do, what their activities are. So I want to take, before I delve into all of that, I want to take a step back um, to talk about where this whole phenomenon came from. Where did the BDS campaigns that many of you might see in churches, on campuses, um, the boycott, divestment, and sanctions campaigns, where did that come from? Where did this anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism being promoted by different groups, where did it come from? And for NGO Monitor, we attribute this to um, the NGO forum at the 2001 Durban Conference. Many people might know the Durban conference um, was a meeting of heads of states that took place in Durban, South Africa. It was supposed to be this phenomenal forum to combat racism and anti-Semitism and xenophobia. And it turned into the exact opposite of that. And it turned into this anti-Semitic hate fest that was later boycotted by many Western democracies when time came around for its second iteration. What a lot of people don't know is that while the heads of states were meeting, Non-governmental organizations like Human Rights Watch and the other major human rights actors of the time were also meeting and they came up with their own strategy, which was to declare Israel a racist apartheid state. As you can see on the screen, these are a few quotes taken from the, the final uh, declaration of these NGOs at the NGO Forum. Um, and they basically came up with the strategy that we now see today of BDS. And again, I think what's important to emphasize here is this was not just one organization. This was over a thousand NGOs coming up with this de final declaration. Um, so at NGO Monitor today, um, following that, um, my boss, Professor Gerald Steinberg, um, he's a political scientist and he thought, well, it was a bit odd that human rights groups um, were promoting this sort of rhetoric. So he set out to explore that and in doing so, later founded NGO Monitor. Today, we're a, a team of about 20 um, individuals. We sit uh, in Jerusalem. We're an independent research institute, which means we don't take any funds from uh, governments, and we are not tied to any one party. We're totally independent. Um, we create information on these different NGOs, these different non-governmental organizations that are active in the Arab-Israeli conflict. And we primarily, primarily look at organizations that receive government funding, and I'll explain why in a second. We have a database of about 200 organizations and their funders. We also uh, promote debate on the subject of NGOs and NGO power. Um, and we also have what's called UN ECOSOC status, which means that we can present at the United Nations Human Rights Council and make submissions to different UN bodies as well. So, I mentioned that we primarily focus on government funded organizations. And the reason why is that many organizations um, 
are funded, what we found is many of these organizations active in anti-Israel campaigns, like BDS, like promoting anti-Semitism, are funded by government donors, which means governments are donating funds for peace and human rights and all sorts of things to solve this conflict. And oftentimes it's going to NGOs that do the exact opposite. What NGO monitor, what we can then do is alert the government to this either misuse or misallocation of funds and hope that the funding is cut and that policies change for the better. Um, so on this slide, I have a few of uh, the strategies that we do. And sorry, I should mention on the previous slide, um, it was showing the majority of donors, uh, of government donors are from Europe. However, uh, Canada and the US do contribute some funds as well. Um, so a number of the, th some of the different things that we try to do at NGO Monitor, as I said, is we try to cut the funds. Um, if, an or if a government is funding an anti-Semitic organization, that should obviously stop. And we alert the governments to that funding and hope for change. We also publish, um, as I said, our research on our website. We publish articles regularly in the media. We're a research institute, um, so we do the research. But we also work with different advocacy organizations that can then further, um, further the cause. Um, we also try to remove what's called the halo effect. A lot of an, um, commonly thought of that non-governmental organizations are these human rights heroes that can do no wrong. And many of them do amazing work. But unfortunately, a subset of these organizations kind of exploit the rhetoric of human rights to promote hatred. So we try to expose expose that as well. And we also try to um, establish uh, new policy guidelines. A lot of times what we see with government funding to NGOs is that the process is very non-transparent. Um, so the government, I'll give you an example since I'm the Canada liaison and I'm from Canada. Um, in Canada, a lot of the international aid is given to the United Nations and it's then distributed to different NGO partners in Israel and the West Bank and in Gaza. And oftentimes, when you go back to the governments, it's, it's hard to figure out exactly which NGO got the money and how much. And so we try to create a more transparent process and encourage governments to follow the money directly and be accountable to their taxpayers. So what I want to give you now is a few examples of what I mean when I say anti-Israel activity. I'm sure many of you are familiar with some of these cases. Um, of course, there's NGOs promoting anti-Semitism, anti-Zionism, groups tied to terror, which I'll focus a little bit um, of time on. And then what we've seen now um, with the rise of the global COVID-19 pandemic is we also see NGOs latching onto that pandemic in order to promote the very same anti-Israel campaigns that they have been. So this is one of the most um, illustrative examples I think there is of what we mean by NGO anti-Semitism. These are cartoons um, that are submitted to an annual cartoon contest hosted by the NGO Badil. Badil is a Palestinian NGO. They also have this UN status. Um, we see them regularly at the Human Rights Council. At the same time, they host this cartoon contest. And these have been some of the past winners. Um, of the cartoon contest. You can see they're virulently anti-Semitic images playing off different classic anti-Semitic tropes. And what I have for you on this slide also is some of the past funding to this organization. Um, in four years, Sweden, Switzerland, Denmark, and the Netherlands had given over $500,000 to this organization that was promoting this sort of imagery. Um, after years of NGO Monitor and others exposing this, um, that funding was cut off. That was, that was a big success. Uh, there we go. Um, another organization that illustrates a lot of the different points of what I mean by anti-Israel advocacy is a, is a Palestinian group called al Haq, And al Haq receives a significant amount of government funding. As you can see on this slide, it gets funding from the EU, from Italy, from Norway, and from a number of other countries that I did not bother putting I didn't list everything on the slide, but if you go to our website and our database, you can look up al Haq and see the full funding details and charts there. al Haq promotes BDS. They promote what's called lawfare, uh, legal, kind of using international law to attack Israel. And um, they're also, I, I put this quote on the slide of uh, 
an al hoc official was present at the UN's Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination's review of Israel that took place in December. It should have been a great opportunity for the UN to provide some critiques and uh, best practices that Israel could apply um, you know, to, to its citizens in order to make Israel more equal. Um, instead, it was many Palestinian organizations were there and international groups were there simply to condemn Israel and only, only focus on the Palestinian issue. And this quote, I think, was very clear from al haq where they said that Israel's raison d'etat, its reason for existence, was the is the domination over the Palestinian population and racial discrimination. So completely denying Israel its right to exist of a Jewish, as a Jewish state. Um, and when I mentioned uh, lawfare, this was a really good example. Just previously, I was on, um, I listened to a webinar with al haq as well as the Israeli NGO B'Tselem, the International NGO Human Rights Watch, and the American NGO um, Center for Constitutional Rights. And they were talking about um, the International Criminal Court and bringing an investigation against Israel there, which is very, uh, is an ongoing subject right now. So one of um, the main focuses of NGO Monitor right now is exposing NGOs and their links to terror. I should add, if I haven't already, that NGO Monitor only uses open source information. Um, we're, I like to say we're very good at Google searches. And one of our major, major focuses has been exposing these different NGOs, again, that receive government funds that have ties to terror. So this is what I uh, mean by that. So the Union of Health Workers Committees is an organization and they've received, as you can see on the slide, there was an, a, million, a $1 million grant that was given from Canada to UNICEF. And then one of the NGO partners was this organization. They've received funding from Belgium. They've received funding from regions in Spain. This organization is identified even by Fatah as being a popular front for the liberation of Palestine terror group affiliate. The PFLP, for those of you who aren't familiar, is the terror group that committed the Entebbe hijackings in the 70s, it's a terror group that committed a massacre on a Jerusalem synagogue, the Harnoff synagogue, a few years ago. And it's the terror group that was responsible this summer for murdering a 17-year-old girl and injuring her father and brother when they were hiking at a spring. It is an active, violent terrorist organization. It also has a number of ties um, to government-funded NGOs. A 1993 USAID um, audit even noted that this particular organization, UHWC, um, it referred to it as the PFLP's health organization. It was then outlawed in Israel in 2015. But again, Israel outlawing it within Israel is not the same thing as an organization being outlawed in the West Bank and Gaza, so it still operates. And numerous board members and employees have spoken at PFLP events, and some has, have been described by the terror group as its comrades. So what we often do at NGO Monitor is we'll look at an NGO that we have suspicion about, we'll take the name of its employees, and we'll put it into the PFLP website. That's sort of step one. And oftentimes things like things come up with pictures um, and information about how the individuals are connected to the terror group. So there's an image on your right showing this is the um, uh, one of the financial advisors, the treasurer of UHWC, and he's marching in a PFLP rally where you can see the PFLP officials have um, axes and Molotov cocktails, they're masks, they have hats um, with the PFLP logo. And if you go on our website, the report is filled with different images like this, again, of NGO officials connected to the PFLP terror group in some way. Another organization that I just want to highlight is the Union of Agricultural Work Committees. Again, it also receives a substantial amount of European government funding. Also identified by Fatah as an affiliate. Also this USAID engaged audience refers to it as the agricultural arm of the PFLP. And a lot of times when we present this information um, publicly, people will ask us, what does it mean if a person is connected to the PFLP? Does it really does it really matter if the PFLP refers to him as a comrade? Does it matter if he's marching in a rally with armed officials? Well, what happened 
was, this was the extreme of all things, is that this summer, in August 2019, as I mentioned, the PFLP committed a terror attack where a 17-year-old Israeli girl was murdered. Well, one of these NGO officials was indicted on charges of being involved in that murder, as well as three other NGO colleagues. So here we saw NGO officials directly involved or being indicted on charges of being involved in this armed terrorist attack. So I'll just, uh, I'll give a very brief example about um, what a lot of our current work the past few weeks has been on, and that's on NGOs exploiting the COVID-19 pandemic. We saw this kind of signs that this could be happening. Um, I'm sure many of you have read articles about how um, there's a rise in anti-Semitism or a continuation of anti-Semitism based on uh, blaming Jews for COVID-19. Well, when it comes to the NGOs, we see some similarities and some differences. One of the ways that we see NGOs, Israeli and Palestinian NGOs, um, exploiting the COVID-19 pandemic is by simply attaching their usual NGO rhetoric um, and combining them with COVID-19. There was a really good example of um, Students for Justice in Palestine at, I believe, the University of Maryland had an event where, and the event was called Corona and the Occupation, and it talked about, according to the poster, Corona and the Occupation. That was about it. So that's one example. Another example is uh, what's going on um, with NGOs related to Gaza, where a number of organizations are preemptively blaming Israel for potential Palestinian deaths in Gaza. They're um, not giving any agency to Hamas, and they're exclusively, again, preemptively blaming Israel for what might happen there, which um, I wrote an article recently about that being a form of a blood libel, you know, pre blaming Jews um, for the death of non-Jews, kind of ex using this classic anti-Semitic rhetoric in that way. Um, and this example, this is another example of what we see. And this is an organization called Holy Land Trust. And I didn't put the funding information for you here because this is also something we see is they're not transparent. Um, we couldn't trace the funding to this organization over the past few years. They don't publish it. And by looking through the government websites, we also have not found anything as of late. Um, however, this is an NGO. And we see that in this uh, paragraph that they're comparing Israel to the virus. And just to kind of illustrate what this means, it's one NGO post. You see that the NGO's executive then shares this post. And it's then shared by another NGO, uh, by the Platform for French NGOs, which is a big NGO um, in France. So you sort of see how the network of organizations, um, where they're, they're working together, sharing each other's posts, what I talked about when it comes, uh, when it came to Durban in 2001, you see signs of that sort of collaboration or the sharing of information there as well. So I always like to end on a bit of a positive note because that's a lot of information. It's you know, overwhelming often to hear about the amount of government funding going to these sorts of organizations. Um, however, and there's um, a lot of opportunity. Um, governments oftentimes, you know, there's a lack of transparency and accountability, but it's up to the citizens and different independent organizations like NGO Monitor to publish information and alert governments and alert the public in general to this information. Um, so it's important to do that. And it's also important, I think, for all of you listening, is to be informed. When you hear you know, of an organization, maybe you haven't heard of it before, um, you can go to our website, you can look it up, you can learn a little bit more about it, you can learn about who's funding it, what its activities are, which groups it partners with, and that can create, create even better and more informed advocacy. Um, so I encourage you to all go to our website, I put it for you uh, here. And I would like to now open it up the floor for some Q and A's, if there are any. Yeah. So I'm not sure if there's any questions here. Hello everyone, just letting you know, if you do have a question, you can put it in the box at the bottom of your screen that says Q and A. Um, you can always send it to the email in your invite if you'd like, if you think of a question after we've ended. 
Um, so you can go ahead and ask questions now if you have any. Or share that. I'm not sure. Uh, here we see. Um, on social media, we are at NGO Monitor. You can find us. We're on Twitter, Facebook, um, and Instagram now. We also, I should let you know, we have um, a weekly podcast that's called Human Rights and Hot Coffee. It's available on all the different platforms you can download podcasts from. Um, Spotify, Stitcher, I, I believe are two of them. And we also post those links um, on our website. And we have different um, guest speakers coming on. We have our, you know, in-house experts speaking about different subjects related. Um, we had one a few weeks ago about the International Criminal Court. Um, I gave one two weeks ago now about NGOs exploiting the COVID-19 pandemic. So if that's of interest to you, um, that's a great way to get information. And they're relatively short. But we are very active on social media, um, primarily in English, sometimes in Hebrew as well. And I can even put Okay, I have a question here. Um, can I go back to slide five? Yes, I can do that. One moment. Um, Okay. Okay. So sorry, one second, this thing. There we go. Sorry about that. Um so I had a question to go back to slide five and to go over the different points on the screen. So the points on the screen are um, basically the different reasons why we're doing what we do, um, the importance of research in NGO warfare, as the, as the title says. Um, so one of them, as I think I mentioned, was removing the NGO halo effect. I'll quickly go over that again. Um, we refer to the halo effect. It's a favorite term of Professor Gerald Steinberg, our president and founder of the organization. Um, and that means a lot of organizations, these are human rights organizations, many of the organizations you might come across would present themselves as Palestinian rights organizations, but oftentimes the groups are not promoting human rights, they're not promoting Palestinian rights, they're promoting anti-Israel rhetoric, they're promoting boycott, divestment, and sanctions campaign, they're, promote, they're denying Israel's right to exist. So that's when we say removing the halo effect, it's kind of exposing that world of NGOs. Um, the second point here is establishing moral standards and guidelines that relates um, to best practices in NGO funding. Um, guidelines often refers to governments adopting guidelines that say we're not going to fund any NGOs that have ties to terror or we're not going to fund um, organizations that promote anti-Semitism. And this might sound sort of silly like isn't that already in the law and governments? Why would they need that? But a lot of times, as I mentioned, um, the funding is so complex and governments are giving such large international aid portfolios to different countries around the world through various mechanisms, either directly to the countries, either to the UN, either to NGOs themselves. So it's very important for governments to have very clear guidelines in order to make sure that it's explicit to the individuals actually making the funding decisions that they should and shouldn't be funding certain groups. Um, the third one is naming and shaming NGOs and their funder enablers. That's an example of what I showed on the first slide of the anti-Semitic cartoons. When we see blatant anti-Semitism like that, that should be called out. The organization should be made aware that that is wrong and that is anti-Semitic. And the governments that are funding it should also be made aware of that they are funding blatant anti-Semitism, an organization promoting anti-Semitism. Changing the discourse relates to all of the above. Um, it's important for, for, for individuals, for organizations like your own, 
to be aware that this sort of world of NGOs and funding exists and it can lead to better advocacy. And also we often try to uncover the contradictions and hypocrisies. Many times, especially in Europe, we see that the governments have stated foreign policies that they're funding, they'd like to fund peace and coexistence and try to um, create peace between Israelis and Palestinians. And then on the other hand, we see they're funding BDS organizations. So it's important for us to also expose, um, expose that aspect. Great, and I see there's a few more questions here. So. Um, so one question here is, why do you think these groups are able to get so much legitimacy in international bodies, even when they don't hide their agenda that well? Well, I think one of, um, one of the, the reasons is because of this halo effect that I mentioned. Um, people believe human rights NGOs are human rights NGOs. There hasn't been a lot of criticism over the years. Now more and more is starting to come to light. There's been a few major scandals not even related to this conflict um, with Oxfam, with Save the Children, with UN peacekeepers, just horrible things of stealing food and um, horrible crimes committed. So the discourse is changing a bit, but I think it definitely plays in, it's, it's still hard, um, or um, it still relates to them being able to get so much legitimacy. Uh, and especially in, in international bodies like the UN, which, is, which are already stacked against Israel, having NGOs come in and further condemn Israel, um, it's, it, it happens, unfortunately, with a bit of ease. Um, um, here's a question. Um, is there any chance bodies like the UN Human Rights Council can be fixed or will they always be a sham? I spend quite a bit of time at the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva speaking on behalf of my organization. Um, unfortunately, um, it's very hard to know. There's an organization out there, UN Watch, that deals more directly with the questions um, related to the functions of the UN Human Rights Council. Our role at the Human Rights Council is primarily looking at how NGOs and the NGOs that we monitor engage with the council. Uh, this is, okay, this is a great question. Um, it's asking when we make it public that a government is funding an organization that is using funds for anti-Israel activities, what is the success rate that the government redirects their funding away from the guilty organization? Um, we've cut off, NGO Monitor has been in existence for nearly 20 years now, and we've cut off over $54 million in funds. It's very hard to say what our exact success rate is because it takes time. And oftentimes once one funding cut is made, we often have to be careful if there's a reallocation and ensure, like I said previously, that guidelines are in place to ensure that funding is not given um, to groups that promote BDS or anti-Semitism or hatred. And that's um, been a major focus also of our organization in recent years. And we've seen legislation adopted um, in different countries across Europe that directly um, creates funding guidelines. And those are also very powerful. So some of the work is directly cutting funds, but some of it is, al is also more preventing bad, bad funds from being given in the future. Um, I would, I would say we're quite successful at it. Um, we off, there's been quite a few articles published um, against our work. Um, there's been speeches made at the UN, which we always feel is a testament to how effective we are because if we weren't effective, no one would be talking about us. So we always take those, uh, <laughs> those with a badge of honor. Um, so that actually answers a bit of this next question. How have anti-Israel NGOs responded to NGO Monitor's research? Um, we've never had an organization directly attack our research. Um, all of our research is sourced. Um, everything we publish either has a hyperlink um, if it's online or it has a footnote so that anyone who's interested can fact check our work. Um, and the critiques of NGO Monitor are never based on if something we said is 
um, accurate or not. For example, an organization has never come to us that we've said has ties to terror. They've never come back to us and, and showed us where they don't. Um, they say that we lie and they call us all sorts of names, um, but it's not, but our research, um, we're very careful with our research and we haven't had criticisms of our specific research points before. It's, it's more defamatory, if you will, um, in nature. Um, um, so I have a question here that's how do, how do I get up each morning uh, knowing the amazing ways Israel continues to bless the world and yet countries um, and yet continues to be attacked in so many ways. Um, and thank you very much for that for that one. Um, I think the thing that makes me get up is knowing that this exists and I'm thankful to be part of an organization um, that's so research focused um, and fact based that we're able to do something about it in a very almost academic, um, again, and factual manner. So sometimes, sometimes it is hard though. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to see which um, questions are left. There's one question left regarding um, US funds. Um, so the way NGO Monitor is organized is we focus on the different government funders. So um, one of my roles in addition to being the managing editor is being the Canada liaison. So I'm looking at Canadian government funding and I have colleagues that focus on France and on the UK. And um, one of my colleagues also does focus um, on the US. And we, as we do in every country um, that's, uh, that's giving funding to these organizations, we publish our information and we provide it um, to different um, individuals. And we did that with the United States. Um, the US, of course, has cut off a significant amount of its foreign aid, especially um, to the Palestinians. We're, were we directly responsible? I don't think we can say. Um, in terms of some of the specific NGOs that we saw funding cuts to, we, we had more influence there, but in terms of the UN funding, it's not, it's not our area. Um, so hopefully that helps answer that. Okay, I think those were all the questions I have here. I don't know if anyone has any more that they can type um, in the box, but they've been fantastic questions. Okay, so um, if no one has any other questions, I think that wraps up our panel and our webinar. So thank you so much, Becca, for joining us today. It has been such an honor and privilege to have you on and speak about this really crucially important topic. So thank you guys for joining us. If you have people that you would like to see this, please go to our website, coupa.org. We will have this posted there later on today. Um, and again, we appreciate you being here. Remember, we're going to be having more, so please be on the lookout for that. And uh, thank you all. Have an amazing day. And thank you so much, Becca, for being with us. We'll see you all thank later. Thank you so much for having me. Bye, guys.